Yes, I was, I was driving to the gym yesterday. You may say, well, why weren't you walking or running to the gym? It was about nine miles away, okay? So I was driving to the gym and I got this call saying, oh, yes, we need you tomorrow morning at, um, on ITV for Good Morning Britain. I said, well, you know, I've, I've got a prior engagement and uh, these people, you know, I've said I'm going to be there. And they said, but yeah, but we really need you. I said, well, you know, I, I, can't, I can't really come. They said, well, whereabouts are you? I said, I'm out in Rye. He said, well, we will make sure we bring you back on time. And actually, they, they kept their word. They got me back by about half past nine, which was absolutely fabulous. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. It was a very early start, 4.30 in the morning. Um, but I'm awake and I'm happy. Okay. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Chiddy. And today, we're going to be talking about something very important. Um, all around the world, defense of oneself has become very important. You know, people are taking self-defense classes just in case you get mugged on the street. Um, new super alarm systems for your homes and your cars are being invented to protect people from breaking in. Even this country, this country is being urged to make sure that they spend at least 2% of their GDP on defense. Because who knows what's going to happen to this country? Who knows what can happen to you in the street? Who knows what can happen to you when you're even in your home? So we're going to be talking about self-defense, but in a slightly different way. Because all of those things are very important and very expensive. But shouldn't we really be trying to protect ourselves and our bodies from invaders? I don't want any foreign bodies in me. I don't know about you. And especially, I want to try and avoid this character, cancer. Now, I know that just about everyone in this room has someone somewhere in the family affected by cancer. In this country, it has become an epidemic. It's a very serious subject. In the old days, we didn't even used to call it cancer. We used to call it the Big C, because we didn't like to mention its name. Thankfully, we now have more treatments. Thankfully, people are not quite so frightened of it. But let's go back in history, if you may. If we go back to the 1970s, the late 1970s, the premier of China was actually dying from liver cancer. But he did something quite remarkable. Whilst he was dying of liver cancer, he said, look, why are people in China dying of cancer? I want to find out why. So he surveyed the entire country to find out what are the rates of cancer. And you know, when you, when you lead a communist country and you do a survey, everybody has to answer. It's not like Britain, where you can say, oh, I'll leave that. No. In China, when they did the survey, over 880 million people were surveyed. The survey was so large that it took over 650,000 people to carry out the survey. It's amazing. To this day, it is still the biggest study ever done on human health. And what did they find? What they found was in certain areas, certain neighboring areas, there was one area that had very high rates of cancer, and the place right adjacent to that area had very low rates of cancer. Now, genetically, they're all pretty similar. It's the same air, it's the same water. What was going on? Well, what they found was that the richest parts of China, the wealthiest parts of China, had the highest rates of cancer. And the poorest parts of China, you know, where they're out in the paddy fields, in the rural areas, where they can't afford all the diet that all the rich people have, they hardly had any rates of cancer at all. In terms of breast cancer, in the richer parts, it was very much like the West. You know, one in three, one in ten people had breast cancer. But out in the rural parts, the rate was so low, sometimes it was down to one in 100,000. So hardly anybody was getting cancer. And this gave birth to the China study. Anybody heard of that? Good. One of the biggest studies ever done on human health. From that, thousands of studies have come out. And if I was to sum it all up, it's really the more animal protein and fat that you eat, the higher your risk of cancer. And when we talk about animal protein, especially dairy protein. In fact, they did this wonderful experiment. They took a load of rats, 
and they injected those rats with a toxin. It's called aflatoxin. Now, that toxin causes liver cancer. So they gave the rats the, the toxin. All of those rats got liver cancer. But as you may know, rats are very much like human beings, especially in the way they eat. They eat the same amount of, the same proportion of fat in their diet as we do. So what they then did, all they did was reduce the amount of milk protein in the diet to below 10%, injected similar rats with this toxin, and none of them got cancer. So all the rats got this liver cancer-inducing drug. All of them should have got cancer. But just by reducing the amount of milk protein in the diet of certain rats, none of them got the cancer. So that's actually quite encouraging for us, because it tells us that even if sometimes we're programmed for cancer, what we do with our lifestyle can overrule it and override it. Let's just look a bit, you know, what is cancer? Um, if you look at your bodies, we have about 50 trillion cells. Each has a copy of DNA. All the DNA has about 50,000 genes on it. And if just one gene malfunctions, you can get uncontrolled growth of your cells. And that's what cancer is. It is where your cells continue to divide and divide. And the truth is that we all have cancer. All of us have cancerous cells in our body, considering how many cells there are in our body. All of us have at least one or two cows, uh, cancer cells there. And I always consider cancer, the disease, to be one battle lost after millions of battles won. Every day you're fighting cancer and you're winning. But at, on that one occasion where the cancer gets to grow, that's when you're losing the battle. You know this lady? Anybody know this lady? Yes. You actually know her? Interesting. Um, yeah, Angelina Jolie, what, what's interesting about her? Yeah, she had her breast removed because she had the gene for breast cancer. I think she's had her ovaries removed as well because she has the gene for ovarian cancer too. In fact, they told her when they discovered that she had the gene that she had a 90% risk of getting breast cancer. So you can understand that you would want to remove your breast before you get that cancer. But just take a look at this piece of research done in um, 2003. If you have this mutated form of, of the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene, and you were born before 1940, you have a 24% risk of getting breast cancer by the age of 50. If you're born after 1940, you have a 67% risk. Now, the significance of the date, I mean, the date is quite arbitrary, but the significance of it is that it, it kind of goes over the World War, the Second World War, when there was rations, when you couldn't eat anything you wanted to eat. You know, sugar had to be rationed, milk and butter and all those things had to be rationed. Not like today where we can get anything, anytime we want. So it was found that the type of diet that they had during the war and those early and the people after the war actually protected them from breast cancer. Today, and these people weren't even trying to avoid breast cancer. Today we know that if you actually actively change your diet, you can reduce your risk of breast cancer from 90% all the way down to below 10%, sometimes below 5%. And if you're given those figures, you may not have to have that mastectomy. You can actually watch and wait. Okay, so that could have saved Angelina Jolie some time. But look, but look, at, these, look at this study, look at this chart. This chart shows animal fat intake against breast cancer. Animal fat intake against breast cancer. And these are all the different countries and their rates of how much they eat animal fat and their rates of breast cancer. So on the x-axis along the bottom is the amount of animal fat. And on the y-axis, the one going um, vertically up, it's the death rate from breast cancer. And so you can see down the bottom, Thailand, very little animal fat and very little breast cancer. Right at the top, obviously, we have the UK and New Zealand, Netherlands, USA, loads of animal fat, loads of breast cancer. 
And here's a similar chart which talks about colon cancer and meat consumption. Very similar, right? As you increase the amount of meat, you increase the rates of colon cancer. You can probably say that for just about every cancer. Yeah, possibly apart from lung, but cancer is spread by the more, cancer increases by the more meat that you eat. And have a look at this one. This is breast cancer around the world. The red areas is where breast cancer is very high. Orange is not quite so high, down to yellow, then to pale green, then to dark green. Dark green is very, very low rates of breast cancer. And what do you see? What do you notice? Okay, let me give you a, a hand. All the wealthy countries are in red. You know, all the countries that people are killing themselves to get to, literally killing themselves to get to, actually when you get there, the country kills you. Yeah? This, is, this is the same thing, it's the same graph for breast and prostate cancer. You know, it's just... It's amazing how the lifestyle, and just in case you think, well, you know, maybe it is genetic, but if you take someone from India and you take them over to Europe or America, their rates of breast cancer go up just the same. So it's not about genetics. So we need to find out how can we stop this rate of, of cancer in our society. And I always like to think of cancer in the same way that I think of a weed. It's, it's a growth, you know, you don't really want that growth in your garden. But in order to stop that growth, you have to give it the wrong environment so that it can't grow. Okay? Weeds like a, a certain type of environment, cancer likes a certain type of environment. What sort of environment does cancer like? Well, it definitely likes sugar. Okay? Cancer cells grow exclusively and feed exclusively on sugar. The more sugar you have in your system, the happier and the more content your cancer is. Okay, so you might think, I'm eating this sugar and I'm feeling good. Well, actually, you're making your cancer cells feel good, and they're going to multiply. And it's not just the sugar, but when you think about it, we talked about it yesterday, as you eat more sugar, your insulin levels are going to go up. Your insulin levels are going to stimulate growth of cells. If you have a cancerous cell, those cells are going to grow even more. You don't really want to do that. There is a, some studies going out right now saying that if you take metformin, which is a drug for diabetics, you can reduce the rate of uh, malignant melanoma, skin cancer. And they found that the reason why it does that is because it lowers your blood sugar. Now, my point is, look, if you, know that, if you know that's the case, why don't you just tell people not to have so much sugar? Why does there always have to be a drug with it? And if you just tell people to have a diet that has very little sugar and you don't need the metformin, then their survival rates would increase too. You know, I, you know this thing about lifestyle medicine is interesting. Um, in America, especially, lifestyle medicine, they have great doctors out there, but lifestyle medicine doesn't progress so well because the health service pays, you know, you, you have to make an income from the health service. If I do a procedure on someone in America, I get a certain amount of money, an awful lot of money. But if I give them advice, I get a little bit of money. So what am I going to do? You know, I've got my school fees for my children, I've got my mortgage to think about. Yeah, the patients can come second. In this country, I think we actually have some hope because we have an NHS where we don't want to spend so much money, right? We would rather not spend a lot of money on drugs. So this system of lifestyle and, and changing your lifestyle to get healthy is something that I believe has a lot of hope in this country. And I'm sure you are going to help it progress. What else? What else can give the cancer cells the right environment. Animal fat, we've just seen that. We saw that as animal fat increases, so does cancer rates. Animal protein, animal pro especially dairy protein. You know, I, when I go to the gym, I see lots of these guys, they're drinking these big protein shakes. You've seen those things? Big protein shakes, very macho things to do. I think people just carry them most of the time just to look macho, you know? <laughs> but those protein shakes are filled with dairy protein. They are filled with whey protein. If you have any teenage sons taking all these protein shakes, please tell them there are other ways to get protein, okay? 
This kind of protein is dangerous to our bodies, absolutely dangerous. We know that casein actually stimulates cancer in our bodies. And that's, it, it sounds like a ridiculous thing to say, given that we drink so much milk and we give so much of it to our children, but it actually stimulates cancer. Now, what else does cancer like? It loves estrogen. Estrogen, that wonderful hormone. Estrogen, like insulin, tells all your cells to grow. And many cancers, especially breast cancer, respond beautifully to estrogen. And we know estrogens always cause problems because here are the risk factors for breast cancer. If you have an early first period, that means so you're starting to produce lots of insulin, uh, estrogen early. Late menopause, so your estrogen shutdown is late. It means your exposure to estrogen throughout your life is greater. And if you have those things, you have an increased risk of breast cancer. And where do you get estrogen? 80% of the estrogen that we take in comes through dairy products or meat products, especially dairy. In fact, probably over 80%. The more milk products we eat, the greater the estrogen levels. And, you know, as a guy, I don't want so much estrogen in my body. You know, as a guy, I'm, I'm happy with the testosterone that I've got. I don't want any additional estrogen. Estrogen, not only does it promote breast cancer, but it also promotes prostate cancer. So dairy products are something we really need to stay away from. Now, I'm sure all of you have seen this video before, but I think it makes the point quite nicely for us. Do we have the sound? No? We don't have the sound? Okay, we'll move on. I think you've seen it before anyway, maybe. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll show it another time when the sound's working. Okay, but it's back to this point. Is, is drinking milk natural? Is drinking milk natural? No, it is not. None of us would do this. None of us would even, as adults, drink milk from a, another human being. We've said that. So why should we do it from another species? It does not make sense. And some of you yesterday were asking me questions. I can't understand. How can milk be so bad for us? I just can't understand it. But it just doesn't make sense when you think about it. You know, cow's milk is designed for cows. You know, have you seen when, they, have you seen when a cow gives birth to a calf? Have you seen that? Have you seen how feeble and fragile that calf is? Well, that calf, within 18 months, has to develop into a big cow. The only way they can do that is to give cows milk. That's what it's designed for. It is not designed for you and me. We are designed for breast milk when we are babies. If we keep taking milk in, cheese, butter, milk, all these other things, you know what? We're going to end up with severe problems. And it's not just cancer. Autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases are wrecking many lives, okay? Our bodies have natural defenses. You know, we have a natural immune response. If you have an infection, antibodies will attack that infection and destroy it. That's wonderful. That's exactly what's supposed to happen. But when it goes wrong, we get all of these sorts of diseases. You recognize any of them? I'm sure everybody knows at least somebody with one of these. Rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel, thyroid disease, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes. All of these are actually the same disease. They're all the same disease. They are just a case of antibodies trying to attack different parts of the body. And if it attacks a different part of the body, the disease is called something different. But it all starts in the small intestine. Okay, so if you took a microscope and looked at your small intestine, you'd see these little finger-like projections, and they have this tiny little layer of cells over the projections, and that tiny single-cell layer does something quite remarkable. It's able to stop anything that you don't need coming into your um, bloodstream, but also if you need something like calcium or zinc, it will make uh, it will make binding proteins to hold on to them and bring them in. 
So it's wonderful, absolutely fantastic. But every now and again, it breaks down. And we get what we call a leaky gut. And that means that the spaces between these cells start to increase. And when that happens, you can get undigested proteins passing into your bloodstream. And when these undigested proteins pass into your bloodstream, well, your antibodies recognize them as foreign, and it starts to attack them. Now, why would your, why would your bowel start to separate like that? They do it when you're under stress, when you have an infection, if you're on antibiotics, non-steroidals, or steroidal drugs. All of those things cause that leaky gut syndrome. So at any one of those times, you can get the problem. And then, once the problem is, once those proteins get through into your bloodstream, and they are identified as foreign, many of those proteins look like your proteins. So when your antibodies are starting to attack, they said, okay, now that we've attacked this protein, we're going to start to attack your own proteins. So if they attack your joints, then you get rheumatoid arthritis. If it's your nervous system, you get MS. But it's all the same type of reaction. And for those of you, um, I, some of you were asking me about uh, children and drinking milk. You know, we should get our children to drink milk. This study is one to look at. This study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1992, it shows definitively that one of the biggest causes of type 1 diabetes is the amount of milk we give to our children. Milk consumption is directly linked to type 1 diabetes, which is a type of autoimmune disease. But there is some hope, you'll be glad to know. There is some hope. <laughs> yes. And it comes in this, this map of the world for the MS. If you, if you can see this map of the world, very few people on the equator get MS. That's because they get so much vitamin D. Even if your diet is pretty poor and you get enough vitamin D from the sun, it can help you. It can override it. But you see, black people especially living in Britain are never going to have enough vitamin D. I was in the North England conference yes, uh, last week and I gave, uh, I think it was this same lecture, and I was saying, you see, the, the reason why the South England conference is better than the North England conference is because we get more sun. Um, it didn't go down too well. Um, but that's why I'm here, right? Um, but do you know, the place with the highest incidence of multiple sclerosis is Scotland. You know, in the world, it's the highest incidence of multiple sclerosis. And that's partly because it's so far north, but also because it has quite a multicultural society. So there are lots of black people there too. So lots of people are dying, and I have to say this, especially women, because women get more autoimmune diseases than men. And I, and I have a lecture called What's Up With Black Women? Um, that deals with autoimmune problems, but I, I'm not sure about the title because sometimes women can take offence, can't they? No, but it's not to do with what's going on in their minds, it's to do with what's going on in their bodies. And this brings me on to something that I like to talk about, research. Lots of people will say to you, well, you know, I've heard it said that this is good for you or that's not good for you. For example, when we talk about milk substitutes, people say, well, you know, um, soya, soya's not good for you, is it? Now, soya, soya does you damage. I've, I've heard all sorts of things. I've heard soya can cause infertility. That's one thing, infertility. And I always say that, well, China eats more soya and drinks more soya than anyone. And there's 1.2 billion of them. And that's on a one-child policy. You know, they're not, they're not doing too bad. Or, or soya has estrogen in it, therefore it can cause cancer. Soya does not have estrogen in it. Soya has phytoestrogen, which looks like estrogen. I don't know if anybody knows anything about breast cancer, you'll know that sometimes they give you a drug called tamoxifen, and that blocks the estrogen receptors. Tamoxifen is a phytoestrogen. So the thing is, it looks like estrogen, binds to the receptor, but it doesn't have the same effect. So it stops estrogen binding to the receptor. It's actually protective. When you look at research, please find out who's behind the research. You, know, you ever hear that research about, oh yeah, a glass of wine is good for you every day? Look at who's behind that. Alcoholic companies. 
Most of the research done about drugs are done by drug companies. You know, when I was a medical student, we would have drug companies coming in to bribe us with, I don't know, Marks and Spencer sandwiches, if that's a big bribe. And then they'll tell us about the research about their latest drug. And we're supposed to think, OK, great, we're going to prescribe that when we qualify. But it's, it doesn't take too much delving to see, well, this research is nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Let me tell you something you may not realize about research. Suppose I wanted to do a research project. I'm a coffee company. And I want to do a research project to say, well, I want to prove that coffee lowers blood pressure. Get all my scientists to go to work. If nine of them come back to me and say, well, look, actually, our research shows that it raises blood pressure. And one of them says, well, you know, this suggests that it might lower blood pressure. I only have to publish that one. I can reject all the nine. So anything that goes in my favor, that just doesn't seem right to me. You know, anything that goes in my favor, I publish. Anything that goes against me, I leave aside. You know, when I, when I was in my final year, I was doing a research project, and I was trying to prove something, and I didn't prove it. And my um, supervisor said, OK, well, we can't publish it. But I said, but I've proved that it doesn't work. I mean, that's important information. But actually, there's this bias among scientists and bias based on who is behind the research. So you have to look at the research carefully. So, and, and when people give you the research, I would say if you're really wanting to find the truth about research, look at review papers. Review papers. That means they take thousands of research papers and get the totality of the information. That's just something that is necessary because the next time you read a headline that Chocolate is great for your heart. You know, just look at the research. OK. You understand that, right? Fabulous. OK, so let's try and look at how can we reverse or prevent cancer. First of all, I have to say this. You need treatment. If you have cancer, you will need treatment. Um, I know the treatments are very difficult, painful, and not very nice. The surgery, the chemotherapy, the radiotherapy, but once you have a palpable cancer, it needs to be dealt with. That is not the time to be talking about alternative methods. Okay, that is not the time. You, it's, I, I, I say this, look, if I have a heart attack, you don't want to give me alternative medicine at that point. You need to take me to hospital, I need to then have treatment, and then we can talk about lifestyle after that, because I, I don't want it to come back. But when I'm, in, when I'm having a heart attack, please don't give me some broccoli juice and say it's going to do good for me. Please. You'll probably give me another heart attack. It is the same principle. It is the same principle. Now, let me qualify that. Whilst you're having all of this aggressive treatment for cancer, yes, there are many things you can do to boost your immune system and make sure you're getting the right nutrients whilst you're having the proper treatment and to help you through the treatment. But please, don't consider treatment to be something that comes from the devil. No, it is not. It, it's powerful. It's sometimes very uncomfortable, but it can save your life. Uh, those drugs have to be so powerful, they have to destroy some of even your cells because they have to get rid of that cancer, okay? We understand that, fabulous. So you must have treatment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on for that. The, you have to stay well hydrated. Like yesterday, no sweet drinks, no artificial drinks, those things actually promote cancer. And this thing, high-dose vitamin D3, if you have any, any kind of cancer, any kind of autoimmune disease, you need to be on at least 20,000 units a day of vitamin D3, especially if you live in this country. I personally take 10,000 units every day myself. I don't have any of these illnesses. But I know that being in this country, even in the middle of summer, I'm going to be deficient in vitamin D3. And it is such a powerful supplement and it has been proven to be effective. In fact, it's the only supplement that's proven to be effective. Most of the other supplements we take are a waste of time. 30% of them actually do us some damage. 
But vitamin D3, and especially if you get the drops, you just put them on your tongue, fabulous, beautiful. Some people say, well, can you overdose on vitamin D3? There haven't been any recorded overdoses of vitamin D3, but I will say this, if you're taking a high-dose vitamin D3, do not take it with calcium, because the one thing vitamin D does, it helps you to absorb lots of calcium, and you don't want to get calcified arteries. That's the only problem that can happen. But other than that, in fact, I was at a conference once, and I was rebuked by some experts in vitamin D3. They said, you only prescribe 20,000 units a day. There were people there prescribing over 100,000 units a day. Okay, but I, I have seen the evidence, and really, if you're doing 20,000 units a day, you're at a good, safe level, and you can be incredibly effective. You have to have a plant-rich, whole-grain diet. So whatever the case, if you're worried about cancer, if you're worried about autoimmune disease, plant-rich, whole-grain diet. You know, we know the great things it can do, and avoid the, the high-density, sugary, fatty foods. Um, let's look at the exercise. Well, we know the exercise is very much like yesterday. Um, frequency, intensity, time, and stretching. Frequency, you've got to do it seven days a week. Every single day. There's no excuse. Every day, get out and do some walking. And that's all it takes, just to walk. Just to walk. An hour a day. Just put it into your schedule each day. I consider, I mean, I do some jogging. I, I do jog quite a lot. I don't like it, by the way. You know, most, most people say, oh, you know, after a few weeks, you'll start to enjoy jogging. Well, I was out jogging yesterday. Yes, I was with some of my, my colleagues there. And even though I didn't show it in my face, I wasn't enjoying myself. <laughs> okay, but I just treat it as medicine. Some things, sometimes you just have to do things because they're good for you. I say, well, look, I've done my little jog. That's my hypertensive pill for today. And there's, you know, people who are doing exercise at the back. Get out, get used to it. Some of you may enjoy it. You may not be like me. And make sure you're stretching twice a day as well. But look, when it comes to cancer, we have to think about stress management because people can eat the best diet in the world. They can exercise every day, drink the purest water, and ask themselves, well, you know, I'm still getting these cancers. What, what's going on? Stress is incredibly important. We know, there was a study done a few years ago in America, that African-American women who believe that they're being racially uh, profiled and racially put down, their, their rate of cancer increased by 300%. Now, how does that make sense? So somebody's being abused, they get stressed because of it, they get the cancer and die early. How is that fair, right? It doesn't make any sense. But the problem is not with what people do to us, it's how we respond to it. Am I able to let these things go? There is more and more evidence with the people who are able to let things go, they live longer. Or you might call them mugs or whatever, but they end up living longer. They're not always het up and stressed. You know, this morning, when I was, um, the, the taxi was taking me up, I was thinking, am I going to get there on time? You know, we got into traffic when we got into London, and I started to think, look, if I get there, I get there. If I don't, I don't. I'm not going to stress about it. So I just put my music on and forgot all about it. It's how we respond to stress that impacts our health. It's very important. Um, you know, Elizabeth Blackburn, they showed that the way, you, the way you think about stress actually impacts your own DNA. You know, by, by being more relaxed, you can actually lengthen these areas of DNA called telomeres. That means you will live longer. It's amazing. So even if they're short, you can change your attitude and live longer and be less stressed. And you know what? This, this actually comes down to something called love, doesn't it? Learning to forgive. Letting go. Now... You've heard me talk a lot. What I'm going to do is do a little test on you. I'm going to do a little test on you. I want to see how stressed you are. See how, how you're able to let go. So it's just a little inventory. It's kind of like an anger management inventory. Now, I don't know if you have a pen or pa paper. Ask yourself this question. When you go through an express checkout in the supermarket, you count the number of items in the basket in front of you. 
or do you just think about something else? What's your normal routine? I know what mine is. That person's got 11 items. It's a 10-item lane. When someone cuts you up whilst driving, you get on the horn and give them... Or are you just thankful that you gave yourself enough time? Which is your normal state? Be honest with yourself. When you stub your toe, you kick the object or remind yourself to watch where you walk. When you see people you don't like, you think of all the bad things they've done to you or remind yourself that they have their own struggles. <coughs> How about this then? Are you more inclined to think about people who've hurt you or people who've helped you? Where is your mind most of the time? You're always thinking happy thoughts of, oh yeah, this person helped me. Is that how you are? Wonderful, wonderful. When you're waiting for the elevator, are you, <laughs> I don't know what happened here. <laughs> uh, you count how long it takes for each floor and wish people would hurry up, or do you just talk to the person next to you? When you make a bad shot in sport, do you curse and hit the ground or and analyze and see how you can improve? When someone is late, you think about how inconsiderate they are or hope nothing bad has happened to them. These are ways to find out your stress levels. These are ways to find out your forgiveness levels. When someone makes a joke about you, do you immediately fire back a put down or you just laugh with the joke? Or when you get angry, do you throw things or do you talk about it? Do you see your parents as dysfunctional or <laughs> someone said yes? Or human. So, you, I mean, total all those up. Now, if you have three A's or fewer, you're, you're managing your anger very well. If you have no A's, you're probably in denial. If you have four to seven, you just need to be aware that there may be some difficulties. And if you have eight or more, you may well have a problem. Because stress is incredibly important to our health. We talked a bit about it yesterday. We mentioned it about it today. It, it's unbelievable. As well as the other research I've talked about, even people going through divorce increase their risks of cancer. I often see people who've been through terrible relationships five, ten years. After that, they come up with cancer. They come up with all these autoimmune problems. Stress is usually the trigger for autoimmune problems. So it is something that we really need to get the hang of. Um, I'm wondering if the, if the volume is yet working, because I want to show another video. Is, is it working? No, it's not working. OK, well, maybe if I take this out. Is this working? Was this working? Yes, OK, maybe we'll try it this way. We'll see. No. No sound. Okay, never mind. Another time, another time. Or do you want to just watch it because there's no... All right, okay, good, 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 all right.
Yeah, I guess it worked in silence as well. <laughs> but it's interesting. Look, um, I, I showed that just because I wanted to demonstrate that, yes, giving and forgiving has its benefits. We, we know that. It has its benefits to the society around us, but actually it has so many benefits to us personally. Getting into the habit of being somebody who is forgiving in nature, easy going, letting things go rather than holding on to them, that makes a huge difference to our health. We don't talk about that enough. Diet is wonderful, exercise is great, but we have to learn how to actually go the extra mile and forgive. We have to learn that. If it's something you're having difficulty with, then get help. It is for your own health and your own future. Now, any questions? So we're going to need the mics. Would you want this one? Thank you. There's someone at the front. Um, my question is about the vitamin D. You talk about um, vitamin D3. Yes. Uh, I have a friend, is a black like me, living here for long. Mm. And she was told she doesn't have enough vitamin D. Yes. She was given medication, but after using those medications, yes. she became more dark. She became, so, her skin became darker? More than the way she used to be. Okay. So my question, there's any side effect of those medications? So if it was a medication, not, the, not just a supplement, I mean, it's rare for vitamin D to cause... Like yeah, if vitamin D causes you to get darker, then stop taking that vitamin D, because it's not right. Um, <laughs> some people think, well, maybe... Well, if I go in the sun, I get darker, and that gives me vitamin D, but that's because there's a reaction on your skin. No supplement should make you darker when you take vitamin D3. The one I take is just a drop form. I get it from Whole Foods, and it's fantastic. Each drop is 2,500 units. Great. I'm asking about uh, soya milk. Soya milk, yes. Um, I'm told that soya milk is as bad as an animal product. OK. And who told you that? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, was, not, I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. I was listening to Yeah, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm, I'm going I'm to say. Some healthy lecture. Yeah. You know, I hear lots of stories about, you know, I was told this, I was told that. What I would suggest is just look at the research. Like I said before, there's been lots of research. I think about five or six years ago, there was a big scare about soya. Yeah, around about five or six years ago. And if you look into the research and who was behind the research, you will find it is dairy companies. I guarantee you. Soya, like the soya bean, is not going to be detrimental to your health. People have been eating it for thousands of years. No problem at all. Even the soya milk, the soya milk that I drink is just soya beans and water. I mean, there are some soya milks with all these additives in it. You don't need that. You just have pure soya and water. Okay. Um, Great. Um, what? Sorry, where are you? Doc Dr. Chede. Where are you? I can't see oh, you. Uh, oh, down there. Okay, yeah. yes. So. Um, when someone has been taking the whey protein, yes. and they become so big, yes. and you want to help them get back to normal, is there a way of doing it fast and safely? Uh, yeah, good question. So when you've been on the whey protein, you've become quite big. Is there a way to get back to normal quickly and safely? Well, a bit like what we said yesterday, it's not speed. Don't go for speed, but just go for permanence, right? So it will take a few months, but the first thing you do is just to make sure you come off that whey protein and make sure that your diet is lower in protein. And like what we said yesterday, avoid the, sh the refined sugars or avoid all the fats, and it will happen, and if, so long as you're exercising too. You don't have to worry about how quickly it comes off. What Dr. if you already have autoimmune um, Sorry, disease? I can't see people. If you stand, it makes it easier for me to see you. Great. So who's, who's got the mic now? Great. Thank you. 
What the, if you already have an autoimmune yes. disease or whatever? Yeah, okay, good question. What if you already have an autoimmune disease? And you know, autoimmune diseases are very prevalent in our society right now. Now, depending on which one you have, many of them are completely reversible. Many of them are completely reversible. Is it all? Uh, um, I, I've got a Sjogren syndrome. Sjogren syndrome, okay, yeah. So Sjogren's system affects your eyes and your uh, salivary glands. So that is because you have antibodies attacking, oops, attacking your eyes and attacking your salivary glands. So you can stop those antibodies. It will take months, absolutely, but your symptoms will definitely improve. One thing you know about most people who have autoimmune problems, they are given things like steroids, you know, to suppress your immune system. The great thing about vitamin D, what it does, is something that we can never understand. It just boosts your good immune system and destroys the bad one at the same time. So those excess antibodies get destroyed. You have to be quite strict with your diet, though. Make sure there is absolutely no dairy, and for the initial phases, I say no wheat protein as well. Yeah, fantastic. But if you do that, it reverses. Sir? My question is a, is a legal liability. Legal liability? Yes. Okay. Um, are you allowed to say that uh, people cannot drink can I do dairy product publicly? Oh, can I say it publicly? Yes. Yes, I can, and I do. Um, <laughs> now, now many, many people don't like it, and I, I have a very good colleague. She, um, her name is Professor Jane Plant. She had breast cancer five times. She's a professor at Imperial College. She found out, in fact, she was given up for dead. The Royal Marsden, our best place for cancer in the country, said, look, the, we've tried everything with you, every treatment, there's nothing we can do, few months left, make all your plans and then you're gonna, you're gonna pass away. She discovered the diet that we're talking about, plant-based, whole grain diet, eliminated dairy. 25 years later, she's still up and living, okay? Free, free of cancer, free of cancer. Um, she spends a lot of her time speaking like me about the, the evils of dairy products. Let me tell you this, this is very interesting. A dairy company offered her £200,000 not to speak anymore. So they, they know about these things. So I say them, absolutely I do say them, and you know, whatever consequences come, that, that, that has to be. But I can't allow people to continue to consume this thing that is doing so much damage. I, I can't do it. Who's next? The question, the question I have is, often when I speak to my friends and other people about going on a plant-based diet, yes. one of the things that they say is, well, there's so much chemicals even in the plants. Mm. And unless you can afford to eat organic, it's not safe to eat that much mm. uh, vegetables because there's so many chemicals. Oh, I see. What effect do those chemicals have on our um, health in comparison to, for it, they say it's just as bad. Okay, all right. I just want to find out true. what it's the effect true. is. I mean, it, it, you go on the World Health Organization website and you see why people are dying. You will see it's around about 85 to 95 percent of all deaths, uh, especially in the emerging economies and in the what we consider mature economies, they're down to lifestyle diseases. And those lifestyle diseases mean there's too much fat and sugar and salt and meat and all of that and too much smoking and not enough exercising. That's the reason why. When you're talking about things like pesticides and chemicals, that contributes to less than half a percent of deaths. But people want to focus on that. You know, the biggest issue is how we are living, not trying to avoid pesticides. And by the way, yes, they may have pesticides on them. But the animals have to eat those pesticides, right? They eat them, and they actually concentrate those pesticides in their bodies. So if you want to avoid vegetables because you don't want pesticides, the worst thing you can do is then eat meat that has thousands of times more of those chemicals stored in their fat. So, it, so you have nothing left to eat. And just one thing about um, expense. A lot of people like to say, well, you know, eating healthy is very expensive. I'm afraid that's not true. No, that's not true. Let me tell you why. Um, I go to Tesco's, and I've done this for myself. I go to Tesco's or any of these supermarkets, and you go into the, you know, the fresh produce aisle, apples and spinach and all that, 
It's quite cheap. If you find that expensive, you go on to, you know, we've still got some of those street stall fruit and vegetable people, you know, two for a pound, all that. Very cheap. It takes a bit more effort. That's the problem. It's not quite as convenient. You know, it takes an hour or so to cook and put together. Absolutely. But what's an hour? Isn't that an episode of EastEnders or something like that? I don't know. I think you, you can forgo that given the lecture we've just had. Pastor. Yeah. Um, you had a question when you were talking about consuming a lot of the raw vegetables. Yes. Um, the difference between just eating them versus juicing them. Okay. Um, as I, I know I can, let's say I can probably eat three carrots, yes. but I can juice like 14 of them. Yes. Do you lose something in the juice? Because I've gotten to a point where I say, you know what, I'll just juice my vegetables as opposed to, you know, always eat them with the meal. Okay. Is there a difference between the two? Is that okay to, to do yeah, that way? Yeah, that's a good question. We, we kind of talked about it yesterday, didn't we? So the problem for me with juicing is that, yes, you get all of that sugar and some of the nutrients, but you get rid of all of the fiber. You know, our bodies are perfectly designed, perfectly designed. When God put us in the Garden of Eden, he perfectly designed the fruit and everything for us to eat, actually, not to juice. So some people say, well, I can get more nutrients in the juice. Absolutely. But with that comes all the extra sugar and not so much of the fiber. So for a short period of time, I know people t do these juicing things to lose weight. Absolutely, you'll lose weight. I told you I lost weight one week with diarrhea and vomiting. I don't recommend that to anybody. Yeah, It's not a good way to lose weight, but it's not sustainable either. So, and you're right, you can probably eat about two or three carrots, but you can juice 14 and consume it. But you know what? We're not designed to eat 14 carrots in one go. We're just not designed to do that. Okay. I have a question over here. here. Where are you? Where are you? Hello. I it's can't here. see you. To your left. To my left. Great. All right. Hi. Um, there you go. It's just a question about vegetarian substitutes, such as corn, mock duck. What's your view on those? Oh, dear. Right. <laughs> You have to give me that one, didn't you? Because yeah. sometimes you, you get up here and you start talking and people think, oh, you, this guy must have it all sorted in his life. <laughs> well, that's not true. <laughs> because, I, you know, I'm, I'm part of the guilty part. I do eat quite a lot of those vegetarian sausages, those soya ones. And you know what? They are processed and they have higher amounts of salt and fat in them. You know, so they should be minimized. There are so many ways to, to make food tasty without actually having those um, substitutes. But yeah, the, the, the problem is they are high in sugar and they're high in salt and they're high in fat. I think we've come to the end of our time, unfortunately. The, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I think our time, I'm looking for our timekeepers. Oh, is our time over? Our time is over. You see, I've been told. Come. Tomorrow, 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 we're going to be talking about guard your heart, okay? But until then, you know what I'm going to say? Look back with forgiveness, look forward with hope, look down with compassion, and look up with gratitude. We'll see you tomorrow.